see you all this morning. Welcome, Toby and Caleb. Good to see you. Not strange faces, but faces we haven't seen for a while. Welcome back. As we look at the activities for the upcoming uh, week, uh, tonight at 5 p.m. we have a message at Hill Street Place. Uh, Hill Street did contact us and there are few people that are ill and uh, restrained to their rooms, but we are going ahead with the service there, so uh, use your own discretion if you choose to attend uh, or not. Uh, but Tom Meyer, uh, the, the individual who uh, has passages of the Bible or books of the Bible memorized, will be giving uh, the message there tonight. He's also presenting to the youth group at 6 p.m. Uh, this evening, so you are welcome to come here and hear his message with the youth group uh, this evening. Will that be right at 6 o'clock, Pastor? Yeah, we're going to invert the schedule, so he'll have his message, and then if you want to stay and play with the kids, you're free to, but... So anyway, around, around 6 p.m., Tom will be giving his message if you care to join uh, the youth group. Uh, two, Wednesday morning will be prayer time at 8 a.m. Also Kids for Truth uh, at that day as well at 645. And then Saturday is a young adults gathering. And as we look ahead to the Christmas weekend, typically we have a Christmas Eve service, but given that Christmas falls on Sunday, uh, we're going to omit the Christmas Eve service and just have a Christmas service that morning. There'll be no other activities, no Sunday school, no small group on Christmas Day. We'll just have the morning uh, Christmas service. And then also so on December 30th, uh, we have a New Year's uh, game, game night uh, on the 30th. Pastor has also asked that after the service, before Sunday school, uh, up in front at the nominating committee meet, and in case you don't remember if you're on the committee or not, uh, that committee is John, Jen, Doug, Josie, and Nellie. So please meet with Pastor at the front of this church here after the service. All right, please stand with me as we sing, Oh, come, all ye faithful. <laughs> Christ, you have given us 
the opportunity to be members of your family, to be welcomed into heaven, and to, while we are here on earth, enjoy the privileges that come with placement in your family. You've given us joy and peace and hope as we trust in you. You have sent your Holy Spirit to live within us, to, through his word, conform us to the image of Christ so that we can have that joy and peace and hope and all that is often called the fruit of the Spirit. You have given us wonderful times with family, like Thanksgiving and Christmas, when we can enjoy in fellowship the excellence of the gifts that you have given us among other people who enjoy them as well. Having given us all of these gifts, I pray that you would turn our hearts to you, that we would see the precious value of our relationship with you and that we would not be distracted by the things which turn our hearts and our eyes away from you. I pray that we would consider these things, especially this Christmas time and as we approach the new year. I thank you for all who are able to attend this morning and for the song and the fellowship that we will have together and for the word in which you are mighty. Thank you for the opportunity that we have throughout the rest of the day to gather together again in different forums and to hear Tom as he speaks your word to us in a unique and powerful way. I pray that you would be with those who would like to be here but can't, perhaps because of illness or other responsibilities. I pray that you would bring them to a place of good fellowship themselves this morning, though they cannot be with us, and that you would also bring them back to us in good time. I pray that you'd help us to have a, a bright and joyful testimony in our communities this Christmas that we would truly be celebrating your sending Jesus Christ to this earth so that God would be with us and that through this joy that we would gain the opportunity to share the gospel of Jesus Christ, this amazingly good news that we may be rescued from our hopeless and sinful state and be invited into your family. I pray that you would be with many, um, especially among our troops who can't be with family during this time of year because they have responsibilities states away or perhaps even across the world. I pray that you would give them comfort <clears throat> and that there would be a sense of family where they are, though they are not with their family as they would like to be. I pray that you would turn their hearts to you and that they would not sorrow and despair. I pray that you'd be with our other public servants as well, as many of them will be apart from their families uh, as they have to stand ready, <clears throat> even during this Christmas time. I pray that you would bless our missionaries in their various places, as many of them celebrate Christmas in their countries as well. I pray that they would be able to use this time to broadcast the excellence of Jesus Christ and the offer that you make through him of forgiveness. I pray that as we continue to worship you together this morning, we would worship you in spirit and in truth. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Luke chapter 2 verses 8 through 20 says, In the same region there were shepherds out in the field keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. 
And this will be a sign for you. You will find the baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among with those with whom he is pleased. When the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened that the Lord has made known to us. And when they and they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning this child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told to them. Let's sing together while shepherds watch their flocks by night. Second Corinthians five fourteen through twenty one. For the love of Christ controls us, because we have concluded this that one has died for all, and therefore all have died, and he died for all, that those who might live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away, and behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us to the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake he made him to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God.
Comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that her warfare is ended, that her iniquity is pardoned, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice cries, In the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up, and every mountain and hill be made low. The uneven ground shall become level, and the rough places a plain. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. From that long extended Jesus, this is like a melody of Jesus, what our friend from Sinners, so new words to uh, familiar say. Turn in your Bibles to the book of Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 9. We're going to continue looking at the names of the Messiah as presented in Isaiah chapter 9. Last, well, two weeks ago, we introduced the passage by starting in Isaiah chapter 8, verse uh, 18, 19, around that area, and did some background on the topic. And then as we moved forward, Daryl Fryer presented to us wonderful counselor in two messages. Um, we're going to continue on with that, talking about mighty God this week, Lord willing, next week and the following week, everlasting Father and Prince of Peace. So that's the plan over the next few weeks. One of the uh, great desires in mankind when he is distressed, when he is in a tight spot, when he is persecuted, when he is bullied, when he is in jeopardy, is to wish for someone to come deliver him. The nation of Israel needed a deliverer, and God raised up Moses to deliver them. The nation of Israel needed more deliverers, and so we find, as we continue on, in the book of Judges, deliverer after deliverer. All of them sent by God, sent from God, to affect a, a, a result in the people following repentance. Even our popular literature is full of heroes, people who come to deliver. And our popular culture is likewise full of heroes, people who come and rescue others. Have you a hero in your life, someone who has rescued you in a moment of jeopardy, in a moment of trial, when you are struggling, when you are frightened, when you don't know what to do? Maybe that rescue is a physical one. You're on the edge of, of a cliff. Maybe. Maybe not. 
Maybe that rescue is just pulling you back from making a very bad decision. And as you look back now upon that, a couple months, a couple years, a few decades later, you recognize that that person stepped in and rescued you. They functioned for you sort of as a hero. They were your hero at that time. Maybe you didn't even recognize it when it happened. But when you think back, you think, wow, that person was my hero. Now, back a number of years ago when we were in a different church, um, a family that would travel and do vacation Bible schools in all the places um, and all the churches that they visited through the summer had uh, a particular... I don't know what to call it, a skit, I guess, that they did. And uh, one, the, the young lady in the family, her name is uh, Jessica, right? Yeah. Uh, she, she had this, this stereotypical My Hero. And, I mean, I feel like if I try to do it, it will just be frightening. Um, but, but I will anyways. I wonder if we should get that camera turned off. <laughs> but, but, you know, she, she, would, she would kick a leg up, and she'd put her hands back beside her face, and she'd say, My Hero. That's not what I'm talking about, okay? This is not the kind of rescue, not, not the banal, um, kind of cutesy, my hero, but rather someone who genuinely enters into difficulty that you cannot deal with on your own and rescues you from it, takes you out of your difficult situation and enters you into a better one. This is what Jesus does for us in the Incarnation, in His promise um, through the Father to come and crush the serpent's head. So, let's start where we did two weeks ago and read our way up to the rescue. Because the jeopardy that all mankind is in is very vividly painted by Isaiah at the end of Isaiah chapter 8. And then we move from that into, a, into kind of a, a dawning or a brightening that is the climax of which is more or less reach in the description of Jesus Christ um, in verses 6 and 7. So let's start reading in Isaiah chapter 8, verse 19, where Isaiah the prophet says, And when they say to you, inquire of the mediums and the necromancers who chirp and mutter, should not a people inquire of their God? Should they inquire of the dead on behalf of the living? And this is a picture of the condition of the, of the people of Judah at the time of this writing. They had God, and they were going to superstition, emptiness instead. The consequence of that is to the teaching and the testimony. If they will not speak according to this word, it is because they have no dawn. They are in the dark and no sunrise will come. There is no hope. Nothing good comes of people who have access to God and choose something else instead. They will pass through the land greatly distressed and hungry. They will speak contemptuously against their king and their God and turn their faith Faces upward. They will look to the earth, but behold distress and darkness, the gloom of anguish, and they will be thrust into thick darkness. And I always picture, um, I don't know that this is the picture that Isaiah is drawing here, but my mind goes to a, a, a man who has been in a shipwreck, and the shore is in sight, and it is about the time of sunset, and he's on, he's on a plank, he's on a board. But as the sun sets into the clouds, he can see the land, but then the land fades from sight, and he's got no idea where to swim, where to go, and there is no dawn. It is a picture of an absolutely hopeless situation, a person who's going to die slowly, excruciatingly, hopelessly. And this is our condition when we deny the light that God gives us and instead choose to go our own way. However, this is not how God leaves us. When Adam and Eve sunk the whole human race into that condition, he promised in Genesis 3.15 to send someone who would crush the serpent's head. And so we find a lot of places in the Bible where this description of sin is made, but then it is followed by a hopeful description of rescue by a great hero. And so we have in, verse, in chapter 9, verse 1, there will be no gloom for her who was in anguish. In the former time, he brought into contempt the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the latter time, he has made glorious the way of the sea and the land beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the nations. The people who walked in great darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwell in the land of deep darkness, on them the light has shone. You have multiplied the nation. You have increased 
its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest. They are glad, like when they divide the spoil, for the yoke of his burden, the staff of his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, you have broken as on the day of Midian. For every boot of the tramping warrior and battle tumult, and every garment rolled in blood will be burned as fuel for the fire. For to us a child is born, and to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace there will be no end on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. Let's pray and ask the Lord to help us as we look through this passage and some others this morning. Father, we really do need rescue. When we go our own way, when we do our own thing, we make a mess of our lives. We fail. We sin. We experience the consequences of our sin in our own lives. And those consequences don't affect only us, but our loved ones. And yet you have come to rescue us. You sent your son, Jesus Christ, to make that rescue. And he has lived a life which he may credit to us. His righteousness for our wickedness. I pray that as we look at this aspect of Jesus Christ and his redemptive purpose as mighty God, that you would fill our hearts with the necessity that we make Jesus our hero and that we keep him as our hero. I pray that those of us who don't know him would begin that relationship today. I pray that those of us who do, but who are distracted, would turn back to him. I thank you for Jesus, our mighty God. And so I pray in his name. Amen. So there's this description of, of this child who is born, this son who is given, this serpent crusher, this promise that has been hinted at for centuries, for millennia, here in Isaiah. And he is described in the words that we are doing studies on. But verse 7 raises a really important question and lends a perspective of understanding to this passage that we really need to get a hold of before we go much further. Verse 7 says, Of the increase of his government and of peace there will be no end on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. The question is, has this happened yet? Is what is described here in verse 7 something that any period of time in the earth has experienced? And the answer to that question, I think it's pretty obvious, is no. So we have here a promise which has not yet been fulfilled. However, at the beginning of verse 6, we have another promise. For to us a child is born, and to us a son is given. Has that promise been fulfilled? The answer to that question is yes. And so we come up with a bit of a, a difficult issue in the way that we look at a lot of passages in both the Old and New Testament that deal with prophecy. When Isaiah wrote this and the Jews read it, they did not expect a child to be born and a son to be given and to in his lifetime the government not to be upon his shoulders and to not have a very clear idea that they were being actually ruled and permanently ruled by a wonderful counselor, a mighty God, an everlasting father, and a prince of peace whose government would increase in peace and excellence on the throne of David forevermore. They read this passage, Isaiah 9, 6, and 7, and they expected a, a contiguous fulfillment. They expected this to be fulfilled all at once. And clearly we have here a partial fulfillment because the first part of verse has been fulfilled, but the last half of verse 6 and all of verse 7 have not. What do we do with this as Christians when we look at this, when we read the Old Testament like this and scores of other passages which promise things like this?